Hey everyone, Harold Fisher here, anchor and host of The Daily Drum on WHUR. And welcome to another edition of HUR at Home on WHUR.com and all of our social media platforms. Tonight, I'm talking to Christian Cooper. He's a New York resident and bird enthusiast, but he is also the man whose confrontation with Amy Cooper, no relation, about simply keeping her dog on a leash turned into a national discussion about racism and Black Lives Matter. Christian Cooper, thank you so much for talking to us. I appreciate your time. Sir. Hi, Harold. Thanks for having me. Can you explain to us, in your own words, exactly what happened on the 25th of May in the Bramble in Central Park? Sure, in the Ramble, sure. Um, uh, basically, uh, the Ramble is a protected area for wildlife um, where dogs are supposed to be on the leash at all times. And there are signs all over the Ramble saying that. Um, it's been a long standing war between us birders and the dog owners who flout the law. Not all of them do, but there's a substantial number who just don't care. So um, I was actually wrapping up my birding for the day, and I hear this woman calling at the top of her lungs a dog's name, which is the surefire sign that the dog is off the leash. And sure enough, the dog comes tearing through the underbrush, um, disturbing the plantings and whatever wildlife might be there. Um, so I said to the woman, excuse me, ma'am, but dogs in the ramble have to be on the leash at all times, and you're standing right next to the sign, which she was. And... Uh, she didn't really care. Um, it kind of devolved from there. There was some back and forth. Um, to make a long story short, eventually um, I pulled out my cell phone to record the off-leash behavior. Uh, that was my whole goal, was to capture, I was going to record this until the dog was on the leash. Because some of us in the ramble and some of us birders have been doing that when we see dogs off the leash. is recording it so we can bring that information to the parks department and say, hey, look, let's get some enforcement. And then unexpectedly, that's when it took a dark turn because she did not like being video recorded in bit. And she said, sir, please stop recording me. And I was like, mm, no, nope, I'm gonna record till the dog's on the leash. And I just kept recording. And then finally she, she actually rushed towards me a couple of times. And I'm like, please stay away from me. Please stay away from me because we're supposed to be social distancing. And then finally she said, um, if you don't stop recording, I'm going to call the police and I'm going to tell them an African-American man is threatening my life. And I'm like, oh, we're going there with this. Um, did not expect that at all. But at that point, you know, she was clearly telegraphing what she was going to do in an attempt to racially intimidate me and get me to stop recording. And I was pretty adamant at that moment. You know, I was like, I can either capitulate to this attempt at racial t intimidation or I can keep doing what I'm doing as I would do if I was black, white, yellow, brown, green, or purple. And I decided that's what I was going to do. Um, so I just kept recording. And she made good on her threat and called the police. And then finally, after twirling her dog by the collar for a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, whatever, she finally put it on the leash, which was recording, and said, thank you, have a nice day, and went back to birding. Um, so, and she actually said, as soon as the recording was off, she said, oh, now that I've called the police, you stop recording. And I said, no, now that your dog is on the leash, I stopped recording and uh, went back to my business because I do not get up at four in the morning to be dealing with the likes of her. I get up at four in the morning to see birds. So that's what happened. How did this go viral? Did you share this on your Facebook page or how did that happen? I post a lot of things about the spring migration on my page. Usually it's about birds that I've seen that, that I think are great and exciting for other people. Um, often as a footnote, there's something about, and this happened with the Unleashed Dogs today because it happens a lot. This was so over the top that I put this up, the video up on my Facebook page. A couple of my friends saw it and they said, hey, can we repost this? And I said, all right, yeah. And I made it public so that they could. And then my sister saw it. And I'm not really on Twitter. I mean, I am on Twitter, but I never look at it. Um, she's on Twitter. And she saw it, and she's like, can I put this on Twitter? And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And that's when it just exploded. Since then, and since millions, literally, millions of people have seen this video, um, the 
Manhattan DA has charged her with a misdemeanor, filing a false report. You do not want to participate in the prosecution of Amy Cooper. She has uh, lost her job in an investment firm as well as uh, other issues. Why not? I have very mixed feelings about uh, prosecuting Amy Cooper, um, and I'll try to spell those out. For one thing, I think it's a mistake to focus on her, on that one individual, rather than focusing on what she revealed, which is that underlying current of racial bias that runs through American society and has for centuries. And she manifested that, and I think one reason why this incident is still on people's minds is because she managed on the same day that this happened a few hours later that same undercurrent of racial bias bubbled up in a much more serious deadly way in in minneapolis with george floyd's murder by the cop who knelt on his knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds um so i think that's what we need to focus on is that undercurrent of racial bias not not her and I think by focusing on her, we're actually giving a lot of white people an easy way out. They're, oh yeah, let's prosecute Amy Cooper. You know, I've done something about racism. No, you haven't. You haven't done squat against racism. You know, you're, they, they bypass the harder work of looking at their own racial biases and how they might bubble forward in you know, a given situation. Or how do we get at that underlying current of racism that's much that that bubbles up in so many ways much more seriously with the mod arbery um and so I, I think it's an easy way out um that's one aspect of it um i understand that the principle is important to upheld to uphold excuse me so that that's a conflict for me um and then on the other hand i look at, at what's happened to her already i mean nothing happened i never even dealt with the police i went back to birding and i went my merry way um, and forgot about her. The second she put her dog on the leash, I was done with her. Um, so I was not harmed physically or mentally. She has lost her job, as you mentioned. Her reputation is ruined. Um, to me, those are substantial harms. That is a substantial price to pay for, you know, the couple of seconds on camera of spectacularly poor judgment, yes, racist act, yes, undeniably racist act. Um, I don't like to say whether she's racist or not. I can't say that. I don't know her. I don't know the rest of her life. I know what she did in that moment was racist. Um, that said, you know, it was a stressful situation. And I think we have all in our lives have, have had lapses of judgment. Um, hopefully not so spectacular and hopefully not racist. And we were all lucky enough that there weren't any cameras there to catch us in the act. So and, let me yeah. ask you this because you talked about your undercurrent of racism and you, you said the act was racist. Um, but at the same time, you said you don't, you cannot say whether or not she is a racist, but her intent in that moment was quite clear. So you're not suggesting that she was temporarily racist. And I say that only only partially tongue in cheek, because again, I her intent was clear. Because if you had been a white man, she could have still been angry and called the police. Well, I mean, I think even but she, but, she, but, she, but she would not have said an African, she wouldn't have said a white man is, well, is yeah. threatening. She would have said a man. Well, well and what's interesting, uh, you know, because a lot of conservative commentators have said, oh, well, she was just describing the, the assailant. It's like, well, think about it. She said, I'm going to tell an Af I'm going to say that an African, to tell the police an African American man is threatening my life. She said that to me. She doesn't need to describe to me that I'm an African-American man. She was deliberately using those terms to say to me, I'm going to say this to police with all its cop to the police with all its attending consequences. And I want you to know that so that you'll stop reporting me through this racial attempt at racial intimidation. So, you know, it's unmistakably a racist act. 
I just, I, I don't know the rest of her life. I don't know her. Um, I know what our interaction in that moment, and I know what she did at that moment was racist. Let me, you, you just struck me with something. You said you don't know, you know about her life. I, I must say that I'm glad that your life is still in existence because somebody called me about this. Uh, several friends actually called me when, upon hearing that I was going to be doing this interview with you. And one of them said something that gave me chills. She said to me that what happened in the ramble with you and Amy Cooper was akin to Emmett Tilling and that your interaction with a white woman who did not like your interaction or telling her what to do could have, and you were following the law. You said it, that you were, at, you were just asking her to follow the law that without the camera, and if you had remained there, it would have been your word against her word and as we, and you just mentioned what happened with George Floyd, do you feel any responsibility in seeing that you were not, uh, that you did not end up in a situation like akin to an Emmett Till, to a, to a George Floyd, because of what we have seen in reference to black men and confrontations with police? If I had been there and the cops had come, um, it is possible that, you know, with the wrong cops, it could have gone very, very badly for me. Um, they could have harmed me. They could have roughed me up. I could have suffered severe legal co consequences. They, they might even have, you know, with extremely bad cops, might have killed me. Um, on the other hand, cops might have gotten there, taken a look at a black guy calmly recording with his cell phone, and the lady over there having histrionics and looked at her and said, what's up with her? What's wrong with her? So I can't answer that. I can't, I can't tell you what would have happened. Uh, I, can't, I don't like to speculate about what would have happened because it could have gone either way. We don't know. We do know what did happen, which is that I left and I didn't bother with her further and I was not bothered further. What do you think should happen to her? Because as you know, this incident is not isolated. It didn't happen in a vacuum. No, that's the four point. People, four people knew who Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper were, that we have seen issues about um, white people, more specifically white women, you know, making, you know, phone calls um, or complaining about black people going about their lives, driving while black, walking while black, singing while black and while birding while black. Do you not see any reason why, maybe not have her be made an example of, I mean, she did break the law even though it was a misdemeanor, but perhaps there is a message for black people and more broadly, white people in in how this whole thing played out. Yes, I think there is a message. Um, that's one reason why I'm ambivalent about her prosecution because I think there is a principle to be upheld. Um, you know, in principle, a principle that's important to us black people. On the other hand, I think there's you know something to be said for commensurate punishment. As you yourself said you know, not to make an example of her. Well, you know, anyone who looks at what happened to her and, you know, she's lost her job, she's had a reputation in ruins, that's a pretty strong deterrent to anybody trying to do the same thing. Um, and whether she's prosecuted or not, or whether she's convicted or not, the laws against filing a false rep police report remain on the books and re remain enforceable against other people who try to do the same thing. So that's why I'm really ambivalent about it because I've seen, I've seen what's happened to her. Um, and in light of the fact that no harm has come to me, I'm like, that's a pretty steep price to pay and she's paid it. But on the other hand, I see there's this principle that's, that needs to be upheld um, you know, for our, our protection, the protection of, of other black people. So I'm, uh, that's why I'm of a divided nature on all of this. 
How has this impacted your life? It's been a busy, what is it, almost two months now, a month and a half. Um, a lot of people wanting to know what happened, my thoughts on what happened. I mean, I have to say it's given me a platform to speak out about these issues, to speak out about that undercurrent of racism. I think a lot of white people, it never even crossed their minds that this happened. I've heard from tons of white people, oh my God, I'm so surprised this happened in New York City. And I'm like, really? Were you not paying attention? Did you you know, not know about Eric Garner in Staten Island? Did you not know about Amadou Diallo getting blown away in a hail of 41 bullets? Did you think New York was somehow isolated from the rest of the United States where this has been going on for centuries? So I think it's been instructive for a lot of people. That's why I'm I'm glad the video got as much traction as it did. Um, and if I can speak about out about these things and make you know more white people aware of this, so that they can address it, because we can't fix this, they have to fix this. They have to address this racial bias. Um, then I think that's worthwhile. What do you think that happened to her now? Because even if you were not cooperating with the Manhattan District Attorney, they have the video, they have seen the video, which is why they charged her misdemeanor notwithstanding. So even if she were to be convicted without your assistance and sentenced to community service or, or what have you, um, would you support that even if you do not participate in her actual prosecution? If she's convicted and she has to do community service and you know uh, anti-bias training, uh, you know uh, I I think that's a just end to this. If she's convicted and she's sentenced to jail time, I have much more of a problem. With that. And Say that again. If she's convicted, if she's convicted and she's sentenced to jail time. I have a problem with that again because I don't think it's commensurate punishment. I I don't you know there there was no harm to my person, either mental or physical. Um, and to say that there might have been harm to me doesn't carry a lot of weight with me. It's like saying oh you know charge it's like sentencing someone for driving drunk as if they hit four people on the side of the road when they didn't. Um, yeah, they should be punished for driving drunk. But should they be punished with the same severity as if they drove drunk and they plowed down four people on the side of the road? No, there's a, there's a difference in the sentencing there. So I think um, you know, for her to to get jail time when you know no harm came to my person, I'm not down with that. It's interesting you should use the drunk driving analogy because uh, because there have been so many deaths related to drunk driving. Yeah that the penalties are so much more severe. And as you know, there have been, uh, since this has happened, there have been uh, legislation inter uh, introduced in a few states where the penalty would be much more severe. And so it, it, in, in one sense, um, even if you are unharmed, the intent could very well suggest um, a, a more severe penalty. Yeah, and I, I want to go back to that drunk drag, driving analogy because think about drunk driving. One of the reasons why the penalties are severe for drunk drivers, um, you know, even when they don't harm people, it's more severe when they do. But even when they don't, they're severe. And the reason for that is because drunk drivers tend to repeat offend. They mm. do it repeatedly, usually. I don't think Amy Cooper's ever going to be doing something like this again. I sincerely doubt it. Um, I do not think this is a repeat offense situation. Um, and so again, that's another reason why I'm, I just, I can't countenance, you know, piling on her, especially, you know, and it just keeps the focus on her. It makes people think, oh, I did something about racism. Go me. No, you didn't. You know, there's much more work to be done and much more important work to be done than, you know, coming down like a ton of bricks on Amy, on Amy Cooper. Well, Christian Cooper, I appreciate the time that you are willing to spend with us to kind of uh, dissect this really critical issue. Because again, this did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, I would argue that this issue is part of the broader discussion that, as you mentioned, 
uh, when we talk about the George Floyd and the Ahmaud Arbery and the kinds of things that need to be part of racial cons um, reconciliation in this country. I am, again, I am very happy to see that you are able to talk to us because as they say, this could have gone severely left and we may have indeed been left without Christian Cooper had it gone that way. But I wanna thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us and, and certainly you know, good luck to you. And we, we wish you just the absolute best. Thanks, Harold. Thank you. thank you so much. That's it for this edition of HUR at Home. I wanna remind you, however, that there is another one coming up after the Daily Drum tonight. It's coming up at 8.15. We are discussing a proposed tax increase in Prince George's County, another very important issue to consider for the residents there. I'm Harold Fisher, and as always, I'll see you on the radio.